Awesome. Awesome. All right, welcome everybody. Uh, you are in uh, breakout session number two. This is session A, Equity Eats. This is systemically designing sustainably inclusive cultures. And I should have practiced that before I said it out loud. Um, I'm really happy to once again introduce to you Hilda Jordan. Um, I went through her bio a little bit uh, this morning. She was our opening speaker. Um, just really dynamic conversation about diversity, what that means, inclusive culture, how to make sure that your company is, is doing what it needs to do to make sure it's being inclusive and understanding about, about what it is to have a diverse culture. Um, so I'm not gonna go back into Hilda's um, background too much right now. Um, I know there's another session going on right now. So you know, feel free to, you know, if people are gonna flip back and forth and we'll just go ahead and jump in. I know Hilda has a lot to share. So thank you so much, Hilda, and uh, welcome back. Absolutely. So um, I shared before a bit about who I was, but I want to give you the story of me um, to let you better understand why I think we should all diversify and how equity can help us. So as I mentioned, I was raised in Utica, New York by a single mother who immigrated from the Dominican Republic when she was in her mid to late 20s. My mother raised us on our own um, as a bus driver and really moved to Utica from New York City in the pursuit of like the American dream, our own, you know, backyard, our first home. And that was the first time I ever had my own room. Before that, we had lived three families in a three bedroom apartment, just trying to make ends meet. And so um, when I was young, I decided, I think I was four when I first told my mom, I was going to go to Harvard because I wanted to help people like us, right? I saw how much she worked. I saw how hard she tried how many barriers there were to even understanding what was going on around her. And instead of getting more support, I saw her being like turned away, people discounting her. You know, she was dismissed because how couldn't she figure this out? Why couldn't she learn another language on top of taking care of two children and working 60 hour weeks, right? I, I just remember thinking how unfair this was and wanting to build and help people build systems where it didn't have to be this way, where people could really work to attain what they wanted. And their work was also reflect, like their life was reflective of the work that they were putting in. Um, so this question about, you know, structural inequality, income inequality, racism, just from a very young age started in me. And I'm also the first black child in my family. So that meant that I grew up getting my nose pulled by my mom so it could be thinner, um, having my aunt tell me that I was beautiful with everything except my hair because God couldn't give me everything, right? Like this is what my childhood was like from the people that I knew the closest um, because that's the, that's the normal that they knew, right? That, that was the white standard that they upheld where even though they loved me personally, they taught me not to like all of these natural things about me, right? And it, they seemed unnatural. So I really started to think about how do we fix this, right? How do we help people normalize the fact that we are all natural, like our natural capacities and how we're born and recognize those as values as opposed to struggles? Um, the law was my way of doing it at first, but after sitting through a number of federal discrimination cases, local discrimination cases, I realized that the law doesn't do much to actually repair or teach people how to do better, right? It, it does issue you a check if it's worse, if, if it's bad enough, but that's kind of it in terms of what we can build up to solve. So I wanted to be more restorative in my approach. I really wanted to help people learn how to do better. And that's how I ended up um, transitioning into DEI consulting and really focusing on that during my time at Harvard um, and afterwards as well. So the first question is why should we diversify? Everyone now um, is thinking about this question of diversity because we're growing, we're growing in our awareness of it's time to do things differently. We recognize with the deaths of George Floyd, the great, um, the six in Atlanta that we don't live in a just society where everyone actually has an equal opportunity or access to resources or to safety or to consideration. Um, 
we also recognize that there is a shift in the demographics and in the work world in general. And so the real question of why has become to first ad advance social justice. Second, we started to recognize that diverse teams actually outperform homogenous teams. And um, that I believe has to do with just the stronger communication and trust that is built within successful diverse teams. And the third is because equitable diversity can really change the world. I think we all want to see a world where we don't see poverty, we don't see you know, police brutality, we don't see sexual harassment as much. And so I think that employers really have a key in making that possible by empowering different groups of people to have agency, to have resources, to be able to develop economically. So I think, and my, my method to this progress is to believe in organizational equity. Organizational equity to me means that everyone has access to the resources they need to confidently contribute to the organization's success. What that means is that the organization is providing resources, access to knowledge, such that its employees, its clients, its constituents understand how they all fit together in this ecosystem. Fundamentally, there are certain core beliefs that have to ground this equity work. And I think the first is this belief that we do have the resources and knowledge to create just and inclusive environments. The second is recognizing that our pursuits of justice and equity must be inherently anti-racist, multi-gendered, multi-generational, and cross-cultural. They belong to all of us and they must include all of us. Um, the third, each person has a sphere of excellence and value that is cultivated in supportive and high expectation environments. We genuinely have to believe that individuals are valuable in order to invest in equity work and make it real and possible. Otherwise, we're just going to be kind of shooting in the dark. To me, my dear close uh, professor and mentor, Cornell West, often says justice is what love looks like in public. And to me, that means that it re justice re seeks restorative solutions, not punitive reactions to harm. Love is really this commitment and investment to the person and their well being, and a recognition that sometimes circumstances lead to poor choices, but that we can all grow and learn from them. Equity seeks fairness and comparability of outcomes, and it's achieved through empowering, accessible, and trusting relationships between people, systems, and resources. Diversity refers to the unique intersections of social, cultural, and personal identities, not just one group. Inclusion is an open invitation process accepted through transparent and shared understandings. Um, inclusion cannot be forced. Inclusion has to be accepted, right? And inclusion has to be an invitation. Underdeveloped and under-resourced communities are products of generational divestment and historical discrimination. We can create organizations and communities that address and rebuild our historical mistakes with intention, commitment, patience, and truth. I've created this Equity Eat system to really think about those different components of advancing equity. The first is success. Every organization has a bottom line, right? And every organization also has an objective and growth trajectory. However, sometimes those things are not clear to your employees, your entry-level workers, or even to different people within your organizational makeup. So the first question that we ask within our organizational audits and our employees pulse surveys is, is there a clear definition of success at the organization? Are we training and building capacity for people to understand that and grow towards that end within the company? A second level to this element is trust. Is it clear how the system and organizational structure works and build towards that success? Does everyone understand their place within the organization and how they contribute? Do we actually have an open communication and feedback system? Or do we only get feedback when someone get or give feedback when someone has done failed to do something properly? right, or fallen short in some way? Is that the only time that we actually give support? 
The last question, which is really, really big within my generation of part of the awareness is just how transparent is our pay and promotion system? We want to know the numbers. It's important to know the numbers, right? And I think the more transparent that you are, the more trust that it can build, because that means from an organizational standpoint, you have nothing to hide, right? If you're able to reflect that, what you're actually doing is showing your employees the same kind of um, trust and transparency that you want to get from them in that feedback space. The next um, set of questions that we ask are about the resources. What resources exist to help a person complete their job? Um, is there a system of sharing knowledge or is it left to chance and unstructured mentorship? I talked about this earlier as be finding the lucky, uh, excuse me. Uh, <laughs> the background um, of really, what, it, what is the difference between having institutionalized support versus unpaid um, and unstructured mentorship support? And where does that labor normally fall? When we recognize that we don't have employee resource manuals, navigation kits, and we really bring someone in to figure it out on their own or to get lucky enough to make a friend, we don't have a very equitable system. The next is empowerment. Do we genuinely believe everyone can grow in the organization and be successful here? When we talk about this, and we often talk about implicit bias, we recognize that there is a difference in the expectations and the belief systems across different racial, gender, class groups of what they can do and what they can perform. The question is how it is not if that is true, but rather recognizing that everything is learnable and teachable. So how can we actually facilitate that growth and that professional development? So our steps in terms of a process is that first we must assess and acknowledge our inequalities. This goes from an industry level to an organizational policy level and can be done also through employee pulse surveys. We'll be looking at things such as, again, your gender pay gap, your resources available, your trends also in hiring and promotion, and also retainment. What does that mean in who is staying in your company, who is growing in the company, and who actually is being left behind? The next step is to, from there, create an equitable environment. How, do we, how can we develop an internal coaching culture where everyone has tools to succeed and be heard among existing teams. As I was mentioning earlier, what we need to be able to do before going external to diversify and meet our goals is to make sure that internally we are meeting those needs of our team members now. If we don't have an internally equitable culture and an equitable environment, we're not going to be able to sustain um, more diverse talent or more diverse needs because there will already be a break in communication and a break in trust and a break in access to resources. The next piece is accessibility. Making an equity plan, sorry, before that, we need to understand why, right? So once we've been able to make progress in making sure everyone feels heard, everyone is being heard and they have ways to con provide that input. The next question is to understand where we go next from here. If we wanna diversify as an organization, let's understand why, and let's be able to embed that into our long-term planning and into our placement. Is our goal to diversify at the entry level? Is it to diversify at our leadership level? Is it to diversify across our board and practices? And the question truly is why? Is it that we're missing certain sectors in our work? Is it that we want to contribute more genuinely to our local communities, right? And we want to reinvest and advance equity by bringing in more people that live around us, right? And then that question becomes, how do we do that, right? This isn't going to be done in three months. It's not going to be done just in six months, right? This has to be a part of a long-term commitment and cultural shift towards focusing on particular communities or groups that you wanna work with, with a committed answer as to why. 
that's going to be how you actually advance equity over the long term in your organization. The fourth piece is accessibility, which comes down to building buy-in. Really making that equity plan accessible to full team input and evaluation is so important. Um, we know that a lot of times this work can start sort of bottom up from your entry level employees and get and maybe get stuck as you're moving up the ladder to try and get power done or the other way around. The, I, um, your leadership has one sense of this is what we need to do, but your employees or your entry level folks haven't been asked about that along the way, right? So the ability for it to actually make the movement that they want does not include the day-to-day -day considerations of the people who it's for. So it's really important to have an accessible and public plan within your organization that provides for that input. Then it's about implementation. We hire diversely, again, bringing them into this in coaching culture, right? The idea being that we're supporting them along the process. They are able to collaborate and then also see a pathway for themselves forward. One of the hardest things that leads to the revolving door and lack of retainment or people leaving in the great resignation is that they don't see a future of growth for themselves within the organization. And that can be one of the most detrimental things, both to the long term planning and the long term diversity goals of any organization. So we're going to start uh, like we did last time by just addressing some of the inequalities. So the first is that there is success in equality. Um, and this is industry-wide in general, but it is also true in New York State. Realistically, the opportunities for upward mobility for women decrease, uh, whereas it increases for men going along the pathway. Um, realistically, ha this has to do with a number of factors, but included in that are sexism, racism, um, pay inequality, as well as identity-related aggressions and certain cultural norms. And what we mean by this is that what it takes to move up within those levels gets harder as you are less of the dominant group or norm within your culture, within your organization culture. That's often tied to the implicit cultural norms and practices of how you move up within an organization. Right, the way that you move up, it isn't just by doing your work well and keeping your head down, right? It's about putting yourself out there, about being able to connect with other people, be seen in different rooms. Yet there are so many barriers to being able to perform or to show up in that way. And that largely comes down to resource and trust and equality. So one of those aspects is a generational impact. When you are the first person in your family to graduate from college, to get a office salary job, um, there's so much that you just don't know, right? The famous adage is you don't know what you don't know. And I think that is so much more true with um, communities that have been historically marginalized and left out of these boardrooms, left out of these professional settings where oh, it is not appropriate to really speak my mind, even though we said we have an open door policy or an open company culture, right? There are politics and norms as to how we do things in an organization, but that's not ever really made clear, again, unless you have that lucky friend or that good mentor that can kind of walk you through it. The next comes down to that fake it till you make it kind of culture realistically, not everyone is faking it <laughs> all the way, right? People do have ins, they do have knowledge. Their parents either work there, their relatives may have worked in an industry. So they're getting um, insight tips, structures, frameworks, best examples, and even samples of how to complete their work in a way that um, can be made accessible from your organizational standpoint, but often isn't, right? Imagine if instead of figuring out the right way to do it for like three months, when you come in during your first week of onboarding, you are shown, hey, here are the samples and the standards of how we do these things. These are the best practices. These are the models that we had from the year before. This is what we expect from you. And these are the tools that we get there. 
that changes the fake it till you make it into a coaching culture. The third piece is, of course, social identity implicit bias. Uh, we have come to recognize that we live in a racist, sexist kind of world, but also that that's not just, um, and I wanna be clear, that's not just an issue for white people or men. Women, people of color, queer people, we can all be racist, sexist, classist. We, and what that really means is that we uphold the beliefs that there is a natural hierarchy of people that are better or cultural practices that are better. And so what we have to do from a resource and trust standpoint is work to unlearn some of that and really get to learn individuals and meet and build better relationships. The next resource and trust inequality is really the structural barriers and opportunity costs to moving up and to growing within an organization. Oftentimes, um, one of the examples that I like to use is how team building activities, which are really important to building communication, collaboration, um, and better dynamics are done after hours or on the weekends in unpaid kind of opportunities. This is a problem for folks who have outside commitments, who have families, who have other responsibilities that can keep them from actually engaging in, this, um, in these really career advancing opportunities. So one thing to think about within this is if we're really trying to create an organization that's accessible and inclusive of parents, of lower income communities, that we're trying to rebuild that corner of the workforce or that demographic of the workforce, how can we build in the opportunities to their working environment? How do we make that resource and trust more equitable so that we can get to know them and it's not an additional burden to be known and to be supported? The last element that really uh, creates this inequity barrier of resource and trust is having an invitation only culture. I recognize that that can be tough to discuss, especially in like higher up spaces, but it's recognizing that oftentimes we're not, um, I say this for myself, I was not aware of so many opportunities and resources that existed within my school or within my um, professional environments because they, were, they weren't publicized, right? They were like, oh, we, we told one person about it or we told another one, but it wasn't shared so that everyone could know. You had to be in the know to know, right? Um, and so as we're thinking about, well, why aren't people moving up or trying to apply for promotions or why aren't they staying or why aren't they benefiting from this program? Ask, how was it shared? Where did we post this? How did we do the work of making it not invitation only, but actually as public and accessible as we can? The next big inequality, um, and this goes back to that empowerment piece, right? For me, equity is a conversation about who eats. So we talked about how success can be inequitable through these pay gaps. We talked about how resources and trust can be inequitable based off of social structures and in institutional practices. And then there's that personal individual level and interpersonal level of how we have inequity in a lot of our organizations. And this comes down to identity related aggressions. One of the biggest things in business is being able to be confident and strategic as you're going into a space and know that you can speak with power and authority. However, every time that someone is spoken over without consideration, questioned about their presence in the room or belonging, um, commented on their emotional state, which doesn't have much or anything to do with their work if it's not affecting their work, or hearing insults about the culture, the ability to be confident and present in the room decreases. Um, I think about this in a, in a simple way where I didn't wear my hair natural for a very long time. I was very, very um, self-conscious about what it looked like. And I was told that it's not professional enough in settings that I've been in, right? And so I'm like, okay, what does it mean that the way that I naturally am and appear in the world is not professional enough 
for these spaces. So whenever I would go into a room, instead of thinking about the material that I'm doing, I'm fidgeting with my clothes. I'm making sure that my hair looks right. I am trying to do all of these things, these little things that are taking away from the messaging that I'm trying to provide or from the work that I'm doing. Now, all of a sudden that's additional labor and time that could have been spent on the actual project, on the actual presentation, but that instead I'm spending figuring out, like just building myself up to say the thing that I've been working on for weeks and months on end. That is an empowerment. Okay. Um, sorry, do you feel like this, and I'll just ask this, do you feel like this is gender specific too? I mean, we're talking about race and, and background, but I, you know, you're talking and I, I can't tell you how many times, since we're just all women here, we'll have the conversation, like how many times I've stressed over what I'm wearing, like before going to an event, before walking into a meeting, but you know, you talked earlier about making sure you're smiling. I, I can't tell you how many times I've been in a Zoom meeting and I'm like thinking or whatever. And so I've had people like message me, what's wrong? You look angry. Like I'm lit, you know what I mean? Like just because you don't have a smile all the time because people are so, I just, do you think a lot of this is um, gender related too? Oh. Absolutely. And I think you can see it right there in the data too, right? Like the difference in just percentage of men who experience microaggressions like this, right? Where no one cares what he's wearing. No one cares about his face. If he's angry, let me not say anything because I don't want him to become more angry. As opposed to when I'm angry, it's like, we'll fix it. Right. And it's this shift in that power dynamic, right? Where what we're, ask, what we're asking for is not some additional treat, like not some like ben, benevolent treatment, right? But just actually the same treatment where don't expect for me to perform happiness and love and joy and all this care when that was not a part of the job description. You're not expecting that from anyone else, right? Now, if it is in your front desk, that's another you know conversation. But even that is skewed on a gender basis because how many male secretaries and front desk people do we see oftentimes, right? Um, and also how often do we see under leveling of women coming into the workforce where they do have certain experiences, um, but they would be more comfortable in a different kind of role or position. Um, I've seen that in a number of discrimination cases, particularly when it comes to race and gender of under leveling, um, and also employees themselves accepting that under leveling because it would be, well, if the leader is telling me, hey, this would be a better fit for you or you won't, you'll, you might fit in a bit better here starting at this lower level. I, I'm gonna believe that, right? Cause I'm thinking that you're looking out for my best interest and for the company's best interest, not realizing that that's tied to the implicit bias and association that has very little to do with my actual skill and talent and individual capacity. Um, so what that leads us to is what we were kind of talking about beforehand. Um, and these biases can be interswapped because obviously they happen concurrently and intersectionally at all of the levels. But the recognition of it is that at that entry level, one of the biggest barriers is racial bias and sexist bias and gender bias, right? The reality of, well, let me screw the fact that different um, applications get scrutinized at different levels and different trends. So for example, it's well known that being able to have, if you have a more ethnic name, you're less likely to get called back for an interview or to have your resume reviewed, right? Just from an entry level position. Um, I've had folks, tell me, even as a Harvard student, or I, when I got into Harvard, I had community members tell my mom that um, she, they didn't know why she was sending me there. I was going to fail and drop out. Um, I was only going to Harvard to go get pregnant. That's that. And I'm like, okay, cool, cool, cool. That, that's not what I worked my entire life for, right? And and I bring this up because here I was succeeding and yet even at the entry level, because I was a black woman, I still hadn't earned my spot, even though I was a 4.0 student athlete, you know, did all of the right things and had all of the qualifications and was by far probably one of the most competitive applicants um, within our local pool and beyond that, right? It was still like, oh, but 
yes, she did all that, but that was almost a fake. Like that was that that was luck, as if though it hadn't been all of that work. And so when we dismiss and over scrutinize that work, right, that's our bias coming in. So as we move through it, the real question becomes, how do we solve this? Like, what do we do about these things? And I think it really comes down to our um, equity eats solutions. Thinking about what are your, from an empowerment standpoint, what is your equitable, do you have an equitable onboarding tool? Is there a resource that your employees can refer to or use to navigate the existing resources that you do have? Is, um, do you have a belief that everyone can succeed with tools and support? Is everything in your organization learnable? Um, and I think that when you are able to focus on that piece and think about, okay, no one in this world was born knowing these things, right? Each of us through experience or education has gained the tools and skills to do this we're able to then empower other individuals to learn and gain the tools to do this. The next is that access to resource. Again, what are those tools and resources to get better at the job? Whether they're formally provided through the job or something that everyone or most people have happened to do outside the job, is there a way for us to make that, again, accessible to your employees? Mentorship programs and ERGs are also really big. However, one thing that I'm always cautious of is, again, the unpaid labor that goes with some of those opportunities, right? Um, if you have a mentorship program that does not pay your employees, nor is considered an advantage in their promotional, like, uh, journey, what we're doing is creating an additional burden on employees, right, to make the company work which is necessary to make the company work, but doesn't actually fade into their individual success. And who often ends up performing that, excuse me, unpaid and unrecognized emotional and mentorship kind of labor, it ends up being your few and minorities in the organization, whether those are the women, the queer people, the people of color, the lower income who wanna help the people just like them or who were in a similar position, right? What we need is to institutionalize that. So it's actually a part of a managerial responsibility or it's a part of your training to become a manager, right? There are ways to get creative about that valuing that I think can lead to everyone um, being empowered and building towards that success model. The next is trust. I really, I come back to trust so, so heavily um, from a legal perspective, your pay and your promotion practices are the biggest liability that you have in terms of adverse consequences when it comes to discrimination. If you have pay transparency, if you have promotional pathways, and you have check-in conversations beyond troubleshooting, you're going to be able to build up that trust and also understand, engage if things are going poorly or wrongly well before you get to a lawsuit stage. And I think one of the big solutions or shifts that we need to make when it comes to equity is not thinking about it as, um, is thinking about the long-term savings and impacts that we can have by making proactive decisions now and earlier on. The, the, the fourth is success and thinking, and all of these really build up to having a system of inclusion of includes employee well-being thinking of diversity as a long-term initiative. So really committing to the understanding that this is going to take time, but everyone needs to buy in and see the value of creating an environment that supports our mental health, that um, can grow with our employees. And that also by doing both of those things, we're going to be saving money in turnover, in hiring and in possible lawsuits down the line. And the third one, which is really now thinking about success beyond your, uh, just within your organization, but how it builds into your organization, which is through community reinvestment. I think local pipeline solutions um, is something that we're all thinking about of how do we get more people within our workforce? How do we develop and grow our workforce? And that goes back to that divestment from our local communities. 
a lot of our schools are struggling to educate our students to get enough funding for programs and services. As um, employers, you have unique opportunities to provide internships or shadowing and build in that diverse pipeline that you're looking for by local investment. And one thing that we know as being upstate New Yorkers is that there's no one who's as loyal to our hometown as people from our hometown, right? Um, I've traveled all over the world and yet the place that I always come back to is Utica, New York. And that's because that's where I grew, like the, that is my home, right? Like I, I see people who come in, they stay for a couple of years and they leave or they come in for a job and they leave. Um, but there are generational people who have been in your community as long as your organization has probably been around who have never been a part of that, but could be. Right, so one of the long-term strategies that we really think about once your organization is there is thinking about what does community reinvestment as an equity strategy look like? Where you're building up your local workforce and pipeline by exposing them to career opportunities that you actively have and also building that loyalty because you're doing things like providing summer programming or supporting local summer programming and people are understanding your name and seeing that your DEI measures are not just buzzword talk, but really an initiative for you to invest in your community and rebuild um, the world that you wanna see. So I made sure to leave more time for questions because I think that's where we get a big part of the dialogue. So I'd love to answer some questions from you all. Hilda, go ahead and jump in if you've got anything you want to comment or question for Hilda, or for, yeah, for Hilda. <laughs> I, I could ask a question. Yes. Um, Hilda, so I, I'm curious about what kind of companies you've worked with and applied the EAT solutions to are working with, you know, and helping them <laughs> to, to take this on. because. I work for a really large company and we do have, uh, you know, in the last two years, there's been much more of an emphasis on DEIA, but, um, yeah, you know, trend, so I, I, my, I'm white, I'm, you know, middle-class, all that, but I am female working in a male dominated, uh, infrastructure company. And uh, so I definitely see where some of this, you know, pertains very personally to my experience. I've been here three years, so it's a fairly short time. But yeah. just wondering, like, if you could maybe share some examples of working with companies or speak to, to what it looks like on the ground. Yeah, absolutely. That's a wonderful question. Thank you, Sarah. Um, so currently I'm working with, uh, there's a health collaborative that's about 40 organizations that are looking to, and they're like a consortium that all work to advance health equity. And so what we're doing is creating their process, creating um, a system and processes awareness to really, first of all, do that transparent analysis, right? So what, who are you empowering versus benefiting from the organization? Because there's a difference, right? Empowerment has to do with power building and moving up the ladder and getting agency to be a decision maker versus benefiting being, okay, here you get the service or you get you know whatever the end prize is or just your payment and thank you, you're done here. Um, so that's the first step of what we're doing. And so with that, we're providing their audit now and giving them recommendations on how to really reinvest into their local community a bit more. Um, the second organization I've worked with, I tend to work with smaller organizations, just to be honest with you, right, um, so far, because I think that that's where you can get earlier in, right, before as the organization culture is starting and setting up. I do think um, one of the transitions, so while I was at Harvard, I was doing this work, not under the Equity Eats model, but more on the training side of it, right, so looking at the professor, like managerial leadership kind of training aspect to this work. And what that consisted of was really being able to unpack what are um, the implicit cultural norms and practices that we have and making them explicit, 
creating policies around um, support for your most marginalized communities. And then third, really being able to um, give them strategies on how to develop that interpersonal dynamic, right? So I think a big part of this uh, goes down into levels. There's the individual, of like what I believe, there's the interpersonal of how we interact and the institutional of like how all of this processes together that then gets, um, that is obviously a part of that ideology that is embedded in the culture, right? Of like the ideology of, is this a male dominated industry? So our parental leave is only three weeks long, right? Like all of those different practices and policies. So to answer your question, I have not worked with very large organizations yet, but I'm currently in the process of building out our team um, and our HR and developing an HR partnership to be able to do just that. Because I think from a legal perspective, there's so much liability that large organizations often leave themselves to, right? From that gender pay dynamic, from the gender pay aspect, from the under leveling aspect, from the failure to promote aspect um, or the processes that they use to promote. And so what that looks like, I think is in the process and in development, but I'm very happy to talk with you further and see if there, you know, if you are interested in some of our work of how we can collaborate and make that happen. Because I do think that um, larger organizations are where a lot of these ecosystems can kind of fester. Right. And I and I think it comes down to not just putting it on individual managers to fix the problem, but it does, but it, they do have power to start to. It's about building up everyone's capacity to move towards the problem. Right. So in a large organization, just kind of giving the short how I would approach it, I think we would, I would ask you, you know, which team has the most buy-in right now in terms of your DEIA initiatives? How can we build up their capacity as leaders and as advocates to educate other people on the issues going on and also the different possible solutions? And I think that there, we also have to, from an organizational standpoint, put shift the orientation of, okay, a lawsuit is the only thing that makes us move, right? Like that reactive position and move into a more proactive position of we can avoid the lawsuit and all the money will pay to the lawyers and the, um, what's it called? And the settlement amount, right? And actually just invest that into our culture so that we can meet those longer term goals. And I think, again, it comes back to that success alignment also, right? Yeah, I mean, I think I think at least in in this corporate culture, it's not so much risk avoidance as how do we how do we attract and how do we retain? Um, there's 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 genuine goodwill. I'm wondering if there are a lot of aha moments that people have as they go through this framework of like. Oh, that's why it's not working. We're trying, but we kind of had this major blind spot. Yeah. So, oh. <laughs> totally. And that's, so I think that's where the audit becomes the most helpful. So what our team does is we create a report looking at your current hiring practices, where you recruit and actually give recommendations where I'm like, okay, if you wanted to recruit more, um, I don't know what your industry is specifically, so I'm sorry, but let's say you want um, more black accountants in your organization, right? Are you advertised, are you looking into the affinity groups or like the cultural support groups, right? They're, they exist online, right? Of like black accountants online, of black professionals in the area. Are you thinking also locally? I think that one of the things about attraction is that it's hard to bring in talent from outside sometimes to our areas, right? And so one of the strategies that I've been really employing is how do we think about a long-term development for our diversity goals, right? I think that there is, and just being very quite honest, right? There is a gap between sometimes the available talent or the traditionally credentialed talent that you're looking for and the diversity pool, even though there may still be a skill match. So one thing that we also push for is skill-based assessment 
and skill-based building um, opportunities. So if you wanna attract young diverse talent to your company, what is that pathway? What supports are you giving them, right? How are, what are the benefits of working there and what is the pathway for their growth that way, right? So I think as opposed to attracting them with like an entry level job, right? Or like, hey, please come fill out this job. I think the real pull for attraction is here's a career for you, right? Here's how we will support you to build up that career. And that's why I come back to this eat system, right? You can't, we can't think of diversity as just plugging them into this one hole, right? We have to think about it as a, why are you coming? Why do we want you to come here? And what are we giving you along your journey here that will help you stay? Because I, I had a great, you know, that law firm paid me great money. Like that was the best money that I'd ever made. And being the only person there with no, with like no sense of support um, and no real sense of like longevity. But I'm like, oh, wow, is this how this is going to look the whole time where I'm struggling to figure out what to do, where I'm struggling to get resources, where all of my requests for help are unmet, I cannot stay here, right? So when you have an equitable like eating culture, right? Where people are like, hey, I can, you can grow here. They have programs here. It is embedded in their practice. You'll be better able to retain the talent that you have and they themselves will help you attract more diverse talent. But that's why it has to start internal. And I think that's also why we have to think about diversity, not just in terms of like a quota of like, let's get one and one of this, you know, kind of group, but let's think about how do we build communities around these people and bring in more of those folks? So that was a long answer, but. Yeah, it's so, it's, it's great though. I especially appreciate like the long-term vision that you enumerated there because so I, I work for an infrastructure company you know we we improve facilities to cut costs but also to decarbonize and mm -hmm. we talk to our customers about a decarbonize decarbonization glide path like you know you have to think about it over a 10-year period at least if you want to get to uh, you know, off of fossil fuels, it, it takes time and it's a step by step and you, um, you know, you can't do it all at once. And this strikes me as the same. It's like an, an equity glide path. Where are we now? We always start with that. You know, we do audits, we do energy audits or, you know, other companies might do financial audits, but you, you start with like, where are we now? Where's the vision of where we want to go? And, and, we know it's going to take time and it's going to be a gradual process but we we identify the key milestones like establishing the various programs that you've talked about that are embedded within hr or practices and then we measure how are we doing towards those goals over the next 10 years so i can map it onto something that i'm familiar with in terms of our our company's work so that was really great yeah, absolutely. And I'm, I'm glad that that's helpful because I think that our quick and cheap solutions are going to be just that, right? Quick and cheap solutions. I know, they're like potato chips. They're here today and gone tomorrow. <laughs> you know, it doesn't work. And so it's, and I, I just, I really appreciate this kind of, that glide plant, right? That it, it is a recognition that how I, what will help me stay is being fair, feeling like I'm being fairly compensated, right? And that I can afford to stay here while the company gets it better. Because I think what ends up happening is that DEI falls to the back burner and falls to the back burner. And it's like, yes, we're doing it. But if it's not a part of every aspect of your decision making, and just to be honest, like it does have to be that embedded into it, right? Where we're not just saying, oh, and I guess like this is also a nuance to the conversation. I talk about equity and not just one racial group or one gender group because it is about all of us having, be having a better quality of work and life balance in our organizations, right? I think one of the challenges is thinking that 
racism is only a detriment to people of color, like it also limits white people and what they're able to do and how they're able to develop ideas and how they're able to sometimes even express themselves or like engage with different things. So the same thing with sexism, right? Like we know the double standard between caregivers and even men who want to be more emotional and more caregiving, right? So when the reason why I focus on equity and I come back to this EAT system is because it is about how are we building capacity across all of these stages so that everyone in your organization enjoys working there, feels like they have a future there and understands how they can succeed and their personal success is tied to the organizational success. I am, um, are you gonna share your slides, Hilda? I can. Um, I would love it if you would. I'm the executive director of hospice of Shenango County. And I'm also the state, like the board chair of the state hospice association. Yeah. And, um, I wanted to have a question, but I think maybe I just have a story, but it's the story about why I would like your slide deck. Um, you know, hospice in general is a very white woman field of work. And um, the board of directors is really into like diversity, right? And it sort of feels like it's like diversity to check boxes, like who's our gay one? And they'll have to wear a name tag because it's not visible and we'd want it to be visible. You know, it's like, they're not saying that, but that's like really what it feels like. Yeah, absolutely. But the thing that I think is really interesting and how it relates to your presentation is, you know, they're, they also just rewrote the bylaws to say that they want like 70% of the board of directors to be from like C-suite executives. So if, so I guess the question is like, do we have diversity and C-suite executives at 70%? We don't looking at your data. And one of the things that I keep pushing, but I'm so young and with a vagina and dumb, you know, so it's hard for people <laughs> to like take me seriously um, is this whole building thing is like, you know, like if the people of color in hospice are most likely to be like the field level workers, the RNs, the LPNs, the CNAs, the social workers, like why do we, why do we have this idea at this state organization that the power only comes from the top? Like, why don't we want that um, level yeah. of, you know, clinician or person that's so instrumental in our work to like be represented at the table? but it's the power, it like threatens the power of the C-suite, right? So I just think that all of this, I mean, I'm such a quiet voice and, um, yeah. but I still never shut up. So I would love it if you wouldn't mind sharing. Absolutely. And I'm, I'm happy to also just have a dialogue after the fact to think about some strategies. Cause I do think from a power perspective, like this is a power conversation, right? And I think I, I go back and forth between prefacing it as like power, privilege, and oppression versus, you know, DEI and some of the equity work, because what we're talking about is valuing the people who do the everyday labor and make the organization run, right? We need leadership. We need folks that are the visionaries that are thinking and handling the financing and the funding, but none of that would matter if you didn't have an everyday frontline workforce that's chugging the machine along, right? And I think that level is too often, you know, we're not the decision makers, right? We're not included in the decision process. And I think we're in this position of, okay, somehow from here, you're going to magically learn and understand everything that's going on up there, even though no one has told you that and find the right ways to influence that from your already strenuous and like long working hours, right? So I say that because I think that your point is really well taken. Um, and what we're hoping to do with like this equity eats model is to recognize that when your little people <laughs> are your primarily diverse workforce and they have no understanding of how to move up through this system, right? You're not gonna get diversity up here. You're, you have to, and, and you're not gonna get diversity that can understand the system and your organization up there either, right? If it's not, if you're not building the, like the rungs for people to move up from this starting level up into that, up into those roles. Um, 
do you find, I guess I have a question for you all who are doing, you know, some of this work within your communities. Um, I know that Chenango is also like a predominantly white county, right? Um, how are y'all thinking about diversity within your respective organizations? Um, and what does that mean for you all? Yeah. Can I steal all the space? No. Um, <laughs> Please. We have um, our longest serving nurse at hospice is um, Costa Rican, English as a second language, and I've tried to promote her twice and to like right beneath me and she's told me no both times. Um, but the thing that I really struggle with in hospice world is like, I feel like we have, I mean, as much as we can have like an inclusive environment led by a white woman, you know, we do, but because we deliver healthcare in people's homes, it like all, that is an uncontrolled environment. And one of the things that I really struggle with is like, you know, her name is Nydia and people will call and be like, you know, I just don't really like that Lydia, you know, I can't understand her. And I, it like, especially now, like this long into the pandemic, I'm like, I feel like I can barely even like honor the like, I just want to be like, okay, you effing racist, like, have a nice day, You're, oh, we're discharging you from surface, like, go on with your bad self, but I feel like I worry about them, like, I worry about her, we also, we have a couple other diverse um, people, and I feel like I worry about them so much, and then I just end up feeling ridiculous, because they're always like, Kendall, like, this is our world, like, you don't really know about it, and you worry about us, but, like, we're used to it, and we can take care of ourselves, and I feel like I just, like, hyper- obsess about like the way that they're treated and worry about like them getting the respect that I feel like they deserve. And I don't think it serves them well, you know, but I, some, I just don't always know how to like do it better, I guess, either. Yeah. Do you have those kind of, it sounds like you do have those open conversations. Oh, with totally. Them. Totally. Yeah. I think that it's so hard. A number of things that you noted, right. Is you can't control what happens outside of your particular organization and your staff, right? And the world inevitably that we live in. Oh, no, no. What I meant is like, the because hospice is- care Yes, for. yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Right, yeah. So it's, like, it's not like you can train them, right? Right. To, to be better. <laughs> but I think what, what is interesting for me is understanding, and I think about this as my mom also, right? Because I'm like, mom, there's no way they can do this to you. Rah, rah, we need to write a letter to your union and we need to write a letter to the boss and everything. She's like, Hilda, don't start more problems for me, right? It's this fear of retaliation further and later down the line. And so I think what we're trying to do and figure out is what is, and, and this is just honestly, like what is the capacity building that we can provide to those employees, right? Such that they can see themselves as leaders, such that they do wanna take up these kinds of roles, right? And that emotional resilience that they have at this level is um, important, but it's not, but it's almost at like that survival level right now, right? It's like, okay, I this is enough for me to just keep my head down and like, get enough payment to do the work that I need to do. But what we want to be able to show them is, hey, there, there can be more for you, right? And that it doesn't necessarily, the tricky part is, does it come with more of that kind of treatment, right? And that's, that's what we're trying to impact right now. Like, how do we make it come with less of that treatment? And a large part of it is, how do we give them the professional development, the training and the trust building support where it's like, hey, I'm promoting you not to just like throw you into another, like into another ocean that you're unfamiliar with, right? But I'm promoting you because you've already been doing so much of this work and I want you to get paid and recognized for this work. Mm -hmm. um, I think another thing, and I don't know what your budget is like, but being able to provide trainings in different languages, I think is also really important and professional development in different languages is like as a bilingual person myself I think about just the difference in communication levels right um and what it means to even have these conversations like like my mom didn't understand racism for years like we it just 
because in Spanish and Dominican, like it wasn't normal. Like it wasn't a conversation that was had. And so it wasn't until I was able to take the time and break it down historically in Spanish for her that she was like, whoa, this is what this means. And so I think sometimes situationally placing things and also training people in a way that makes them feel most comfortable to build their capacity is, is definitely the key. Now, getting higher ups to invest that money, another conversation, right? But I think does come back to that DEI long-term argument, right? Where, how are we gonna get 70% diversity leadership <laughs> in the C, out of the C-suite when that's not what our C, when our C-suite is 60% white men. And I was just doing some research and there were more C-suite level executives named John than there were women. Just named John. <laughs> so it's oh. a long battle. Yeah. <laughs> But I think that understanding how we can make, again, little changes where we're paying, it starts with like pay. And then it starts with recognition. And honestly, it may seem trivial, or I guess this is like a, this is an unofficial, but like an up and coming HMJ strategy of being able to break down the skills and the competency levels so that you're awarding your employees um, as they progress through them. That does sound like a little bit more work, but, and it is at the beginning, I'm just letting you know it is, but it's worth it because you're building up their own trust and confidence and like, oh, wait, no, I know that I do this skill well, right? Like I got this job certificate and it becomes an equalized playing field for everyone to recognize and acknowledge, oh, this person does this, this, and this. So that, that's a way to maybe think about your promotion of more diverse um, talent where, hey, I'm not giving this to you, you've earned it. And that may be why they're also not taking up the position because they don't want it to be a, she likes me, right? I want mm -hmm. to feel that I earned this. Mm -hmm. So if you're able to break that down for them and show that pathway to progression, you'll really be able to, I think, get more folks moving into that promotion line because it doesn't feel like a handout. It actually feels sure. like something they earned. Mm -hmm. No, that's super valuable. Thank you. All right. Um, thank you so much. And I um, I know it's, it's we're cutting into people's lunch, so I want to be um, sensitive to that. Um, this is great. And again, just like I said this morning, I think we could have a whole, like, just hill the day. We're going to have to work on that. <laughs> Um, great, great conversation, and um, we're going to go ahead and wrap this session up. Let me just uh, finish the recording.